On 24 August the Battle of the Shevardino Redoubt was fought. On 25 not a shot was fired by either side, and on 26 the Battle of Borodino itself took place. Why and how were the battles of Shevardino and Borodino given and accepted? Why was the Battle of Borodino fought? There was not the least sense in it for either the French or the Russians. Its immediate result for the Russians was and was bound to be that we were brought nearer to the destruction of Moscow which we feared more than anything in the world. And for the French its immediate result was that they were brought nearer to the destruction of their whole army which they feared more than anything in the world. What the result must be was quite obvious, and yet Napoleon offered and Kutuzov accepted that battle. If the commanders had been guided by reason, it would seem that it must have been obvious to Napoleon that by advancing 1300 miles and giving battle with a probability of losing a quarter of his army, he was advancing to certain destruction, and it must have been equally clear to Kutuzov that by accepting battle and risking the loss of a quarter of his army he would certainly lose Moscow. For Kutuzov this was mathematically clear, as it is that if when playing drafts I have one man less and go on exchanging, I shall certainly lose, and therefore should not exchange. When my opponent has 16 men and I have 14, I am only one-eighth weaker than he, but when I have exchanged 13 more men he will be three times as strong as I am. Before the Battle of Borodino our strength in proportion to the French was about as 5 to 6 but after that battle it was little more than 1 to 2. Previously we had 100,000 against 120,000. Afterwards little more than 50,000 against 100,000. Yet the shrewd and experienced Kutuzov accepted the battle, while Napoleon, who was said to be a commander of genius, gave it, losing a quarter of his army and lengthening his lines of communication still more. If it is said that he expected to end the campaign by occupying Moscow as he had ended a previous campaign by occupying Vienna, there is much evidence to the contrary. Napoleon's historians themselves tell us that from Smolensk onwards he wished to stop knew the danger of his extended position, and knew that the occupation of Moscow would not be the end of the campaign. For he had seen at Smolensk the state in which Russian towns were left to him, and had not received a single reply to his repeated announcements of his wish to negotiate. In giving and accepting battle at Borodino, Kutuzov acted involuntarily and irrationally. But later on, to fit what had occurred, the historians provided cunningly devised evidence of the foresight and genius the generals who, of all the blind tools of history were the most enslaved and involuntary. The ancients have left us model heroic poems in which the heroes furnish the whole interest of the story. And we are still unable to accustom ourselves to the fact that for our epoch histories of that kind are meaningless. On the other question, how the Battle of Borodino and the preceding Battle of Shevardino were fought, there are also exists a definite and well-known, but quite false, conception. All the historians describe the affair as follows. The Russian army, they say, in its retreat from Smolensk sought out for itself the best position for a general engagement and found such a position at Borodino. The Russians, they say, fortified this position in advance on the left of the high road from Moscow to Smolensk and almost at a right angle to it, from Borodino to Utitsa, at the very place where the battle was fought. In front of this position, they say, a fortified outpost was set up on the Shevardino Mound to observe the enemy. On the 24th, we are told, Napoleon attacked this advanced post and took it, and, on the 26th, attacked the whole Russian army, which was in position on the field of Borodino. So the histories say, and it is all quite wrong, as anyone who cares to look into the matter can easily convince himself. The Russians did not seek out the best position, but, on the contrary, during the retreat passed many positions better than Borodino. They did not stop at any one of these positions because Kutuzov did not wish to occupy a position he had not himself chosen. Because the popular demand for a battle had not yet expressed itself strongly enough, and because Miloradovich had not yet arrived with the militia, and for many other reasons. The fact is, that other positions they had passed were stronger, and that the position at Borodino the one where the battle was fought. 
far from being strong, was no more a position than any other spot one might find in the Russian Empire by sticking a pin into the map at hazard. Not only did the Russians not fortify the position on the field of Borodino to the left of, and at a right angle to, the high road that is, the position on which the battle took place, but never till 25 August, 1812, did they think that a battle might be fought there. This was shown first by the fact that there were no entrenchments there by the 25th and that those begun on the 25th and 26th were not completed. And secondly, by the position of the Shevardino Redoubt. That redoubt was quite senseless in front of the position where the battle was accepted. Why was it more strongly fortified than any other post? And why were all efforts exhausted and 6,000 men sacrificed to defend it till late at night on the 24th? A Cossack patrol would have sufficed to observe the enemy. Thirdly, as proof that the position on which the battle was fought had not been foreseen and that the Shevardino redoubt was not an advanced post of that position, we have the fact that up to the 25th Barclay de Tolly and Bagration were convinced that the Shevardino redoubt was the left flank of the position, and that Kutuzov himself in his report, written in hot haste after the battle, speaks of the Shevardino redoubt as the left flank of the position. It was much later, when reports on the Battle of Borodino were written at leisure, that the incorrect and extraordinary statement was invented probably to justify the mistakes of a commander-in-chief who had to be represented as infallible that the Shevardino redoubt was in advanced post whereas in reality it was simply a fortified point on the left flank and that the Battle of Borodino was fought by us on an entrenched position previously selected, whereas it was fought on a quite unexpected spot which was almost unentrenched. The case was evidently this. A position was selected along the river Kolocha, which crosses the high road not at a right angle but at an acute angle so that the left flank was at Shevardino the right flank near the village of Novo, and the centre at Borodino at the confluence of the rivers Kolocha and Voina. To anyone who looks at the field of Borodino without thinking of how the battle was actually fought, this position, protected by the river Kolocha, presents itself as obvious for an army whose object was to prevent an enemy from advancing along the Smolensk road to Moscow. Napoleon, riding to Valuevo on the 24th, did not see as the history books say he did the position of the Russians from Utitsa to Borodino he could not have seen that position because it did not exist. Nor did he see an advanced post of the Russian army. But while pursuing the Russian rearguard he came upon the left flank of the Russian position at the Shevardino redoubt and unexpectedly for the Russians moved his army across the Kolocha. And the Russians, not having time to begin a general engagement, withdrew their left wing from the position they had intended to occupy and took up a new position which had not been foreseen and was not fortified by crossing to the other side of the Kolocha to the left of the high road. Napoleon shifted the whole forthcoming battle from right to left looking from the Russian side and transferred it to the plain between Utitsa. Semenovsky, and Borodino a plain no more advantageous as a position than any other plain in Russia and there the whole battle of 26 August took place. Had Napoleon not ridden out on the evening of the 24th to the Kolocha, and had he not then ordered an immediate attack on the redoubt but had begun the attack next morning, no one would have doubted that the Shevardino redoubt was the left flank of our and the battle would have taken place where we expected it. In that case we should probably have defended the Shevardino redoubt our left flank still more obstinately. We should have attacked Napoleon in the centre or on the right, and the engagement would have taken place on the 25th in the position we intended and had fortified. But as the attack on our left flank took place in the evening after the retreat of our rearguard that is, immediately after the fight at Gridnova, and as the Russian commanders did not wish, or were not in time, to begin a general engagement then on the evening of the 24th. The first and chief action of the Battle of Borodino was already lost on the 24th, and obviously led to the loss of the one fought on the 26th. After the loss of the Shevardino Redoubt, we found ourselves on the morning of the 25th without a position for our left flank, and were forced to bend it back and hastily entrench it where it chanced to be. Not only was the Russian army on the 26th defended by weak, unfinished entrenchments but there, 
Disadvantage of that position was increased by the fact that the Russian commanders not having fully realized what had happened, namely the loss of our position on the left flank and the shifting of the whole field of the forthcoming battle from right to left maintained our extended position from the village of Novo to Utitsa, and consequently had to move their forces from right to left during the battle. So it happened that throughout the whole battle the Russians opposed the entire French army launched against our left flank with but half as many men. Poniatowski's action against Utitsa, and Uvarov's on the right flank against the French were actions distinct from the main course of the battle. So the Battle of Borodino did not take place at all as in an effort to conceal our commander's mistakes even at the cost of diminishing the glory due to the Russian army and people it has been described. The Battle of Borodino was not fought on a chosen and entrenched position with forces only slightly weaker than those of the enemy. But, as a result of the loss of the Shevardino Redoubt, the Russians fought the Battle of Borodino on an open and almost unentrenched position, with forces only half as numerous as the French. That is to say, under conditions in which it was not merely unthinkable to fight for ten hours and secure an indecisive result but unthinkable to keep an army even from complete disintegration and flight.